It's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Hello, my darlings. Lovely to see you all. Today, I got so much stuff to get through. It's like a recipe for exhaustion, <laughs> including Clarence Thomas and also pictures for his wife, Ginny Thomas, who is under fire right now. Also, I did Joe Biden for the next six months because everybody's curious about that. Plus the Russia versus NATO standoff that people are so worried about. Also, somebody asked me to take a look at something I know absolutely nothing about. The upcoming novel from George R. R. Martin called The Winds of Winter. Uh, apparently, fans of Game of Thrones have been waiting for this novel for 11 years and he still hasn't completed it. It's something like 1,500 pages long and he's taking a very long time. So they said, when is it going to arrive? And therefore, I did pictures for that. Sarah Palin is suing the New York Times for defamation and jury selection was due to start this week. Only she has got the coronavirus for the second time because she's not vaccinated and so it had to be postponed and I thought I'd take a look at that and see how that case was going to go. And finally, the Zen master Thich Nhat Han died in the last few days and I thought I'd take a look at crossover pictures for him. They were so wonderful and uh, I found them very moving. So uh, I'll show you those as well. Welcome to the new subscribers. I always say that, but there are lots of you and it's lovely to see you as well. Uh, to the donors, you know what I'm going to say. I appreciate you so much. In fact, can we have a little light applause for the donors, please? There you go. That's just for you. Thank you very much. You're very, very kind. And of course, thank you, as always, to the commenters. Lots of really interesting comments. I haven't uh, replied to the comments on the healing video yet, but I'm planning on doing that tomorrow. So I'll deal with it then. But uh, thank you for them all. And also, thank you for the encouragement for Olive's fashion modeling career. <laughs> Not that she needs any encouragement. She's such a poser. <laughs> but she's doing incredible. In fact, I told her, if you're going to model fur, that might lead to trouble down the road. But uh, she's doing incredibly well. She's running around like normal now. She's chasing bits of paper. I think she's a little frustrated at being kept indoors. She had that wild period and she wants to go out. As a result, she's eating house plants and flowers. And in fact, she ate half a cactus the other day and then threw up. I thought animals were cactose intolerant. <laughs> but she eats cactus. Otherwise, she's doing incredibly well, which is nice to know. Although somebody said, you do realize that Olive, spelt backwards, is evil O. Ooh, that's not good. <laughs> Although it's very interesting because many years ago, there was a woman, I don't know her name anymore, but she was offering uh, readings of people's energy over the internet. And so I thought, oh, God, I have that done. I sent her money, maybe my birth date or something, and then just waited for uh, the result to come back. Well, nothing happened. And then suddenly I got my money back just out of the blue. My money was back in my account. So I wrote to her and said, uh, I got my money back. Is there a reason why? And she goes, I'm not doing your energy. I refuse. And I've written a blog post to explain why. She's <laughs> written the blog post. So she gives me a link and I go and read the blog post. And she says, like, the evil one, capital E, capital O, the evil one is back among us. <laughs> and uh, all the way through, she called me the evil one, E-O. And uh, when I heard about Olive, I thought, oh. Evil O. <laughs> that reminds me of that really crazy woman who thought I was the devil. <laughs> anyway, let's take a look at Clarence Thomas, who is the longest serving judge on the Supreme Court. He's been there for 30 years as an associate justice. And he is one of those people who believes in interpreting literally the Constitution. But he also believes in the imposition of natural law which I thought was very interesting. He believes that there is a certain way that life is meant to unfold, a certain kind of ethical and moral behavior that human beings were born to abide by. And so as well as enforcing the Constitution of the USA, he also uh, resorts to natural law in deciding what is right or wrong or what is appropriate or not. 
Well, that's all right. Uh, but he also, I'm assuming, consults his wife, Ginny, who is a far-right activist. We'll get to her in a second. And this is causing problems for him because people are going, well, when it comes to anything related to the insurrection or anything related to Trump, shouldn't you be recusing yourself from the bench? And he's refusing to recuse himself. So I thought I'd take a look at his pictures and see how that was going to go. And when I found him, he was, I'm not going to draw this all the way through, by the way, because it's too hard, but he was in a Dracula kind of cape. And you know how those actors in the 30s, like Bela Lugosi, used to go, whoa, oh, I'm Dracula! You know, and they used to do this with their hand. They just put their cape across their face to hide it. Well, he was doing that. He had this cape on and he was covering his face as though beneath the folds of the cape, there was a lot going on that we don't know about. A lot of secrets, a lot of hidden motivations. It was all enclosed, not giving anything away. And in front of him was a set of curtains. This seemed to indicate a difficult phase. Not maybe the beginning of the difficult phase, but perhaps the end of it. Like, once you get to the curtains, this phase ends. Oh, great! I am so tired of this phase! Right? And so he goes to the curtains and he steps through them, at which point I stop drawing the cape. <laughs> Forgive me, but I'm not drawing that cape every time. Anyway, he steps through. And he starts walking, but what was interesting about this next phase was that the floor was made of glass. And the real floor underneath was on a steep incline. Now, he wasn't walking on the steep incline, he was walking on the glass. But he was aware, at this point, of the problems his marriage, his association with Ginny Thomas, is causing for the Supreme Court's reputation. This is a real sticky subject. We don't know how much he endorses his wife's views. We know he's conservative, but how far right his views go. But this flaw suggested that he was aware of how far he might fall and that his position was at risk. But at the end of this glass period, the flaw became incredibly slippery. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean he stands down. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's told to leave the bench because of conflict of interest. But it does suggest that now more scrutiny is on him all the time. Depending on the decisions he makes, was that a wife influence thing? Was this a wife influence thing? Ooh, slidey, slidey. And so, although he may go, well, I'm sorry, I'm appointed for life. I'm not stepping down just because of my politics. It, it might just be that it makes his position very sticky. Almost as if the world now looks at him with a totally jaundiced eye. Like, oh, that guy, what's he hiding? I am hiding nothing. Something is going on and we need to know. It's not fair. It's not justice if every decision you make is based on politics as opposed to the law. That's what people would argue, I think. Now, his wife, of course, Virginia Thomas, is a Tea Party person, a far-right activist. She founded Liberty Central, which is a non-profit dedicated to fighting progressivism. She's against all forms of government intrusion into people's lives. We're not absolutely sure yet what her involvement in the January 6th insurrection was. I keep reading things that she may have done that, she may have done this, we don't know, until the committee reports. But it does seem like she's going to be in trouble in some way. When I went into her energy, she was just walking along very energetically. To her left was a highway which she couldn't get onto. It's like, I really want to be there. I really want to be active. I want to be doing things. But each time I try to do things, there are obstacles that stop me doing it. And what there was actually was one revolving triangle after another. It was very odd. There were just big wooden triangles that were spinning around. And when she tried to get onto the highway, if she got too close, one of these triangles would just rebuff her and throw her off again. 
Very strange. And she tried this once, and she tried it twice. Another triangle, another triangle. So she was being kept away, maybe by investigations, maybe by having to keep a low profile because of her uh, husband's position or whatever. Who knows what's going on behind the scenes? I do, I know. Well, yeah, he does, but we don't know what's going on. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so she gets to the end of this highway and there's a hill. This is where she can finally start making her moves again. Something clears, the triangles are done, and she can start moving forward. But it's a challenge. Getting onto this road is not easy. She does it, though, and she starts moving forward. But then it brings her onto a flat, level surface. I had no idea what this was to begin with. But once she stepped onto it, it was clear that it was made of ice maybe it was certainly very slippery hang on a second isn't that what happened to clarence as well the slippery surface oh only in her case there was a definite momentum to it she was sliding in spite of herself towards the edge oh i'm moving how do i stop myself oh ow, like that and there was some kind of event that throws her plans into disarray or moves her right off her chosen path against her will. She fell all the way down and landed hard, but immediately jumped up and was off again. This woman has a spirit of belief about her, uh, commitment about her, whatever this thing is that she's into, this right-wing Tea Party political thing, she is full of this. It imbues every uh, cell in her body. And she immediately got up and started walking and then began this steep climb, which represents even more challenges. But it's like, yeah, okay, that wasn't good. I'll dust myself off and I'll start again. And off she goes. Wow. Uh, somebody asked me to take a look at the upcoming novel from George R. R. Martin, the exceedingly popular and successful author of the Song of Ice and Fire series, apparently. I have never read them, I know nothing about them, uh, except to say, of course, that the Game of Thrones was based on them. There are five books out already. The last one came out in 2011. And he is writing number six and number seven right now. Number six is called The Winds of Winter. And he's written hundreds and hundreds of pages. And by the last year, had said, oh, I've got hundreds more pages to write. Good grief. And so fans are saying, look, when will this book arrive, for goodness sake? How much longer can this guy take to write this? So I went into the energy. But before I tell you what the pictures were, can I just rate this a U? In fact, even a U plus for unreliable and then some. <laughs> because I know nothing about Game of Thrones. I've never seen it. I've never read the books. And uh, I'm not the slightest bit interested in this. And I've never done when a book will come out before. But I thought I'd tell you the pictures because they were kind of interesting. And when I found it, there was the book. And it was being pulled along, albeit with considerable effort, by two ropes that led off across a valley. Now, as it was being pulled along, the mud was going down the sides. It was being pushed aside, but it was a real hard slog. But there was the cliff edge. It was in sight. When it went over the cliff, which I assume is completion before editing and rewrites or whatever, but when it got to the cliff, it went over and it slammed down against the cliff on the opposite side of this valley or whatever this was. So that, I assume, is its delivery finally to the publisher. Because then it's hauled up the side of this cliff and there's... Um, a cave there that looks like a pizza oven, but it's dragged into the cave. Now, I imagine that this tunnel that it finds itself in is the editing and publishing process, which takes time. But as it goes along, it bends upwards, which suggests its approach to daylight. Like, oh my God, it's finally here. 
That was the process of publishing this book. No, he hadn't finished it. Yes, he was going to finish it, and it didn't seem like that far off, actually. Then you had the delivery to the publishers. Then you had the editing process. And finally, it came out. <laughs> now, on January the 22nd, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk and Zen master Thich Nhat Han, not Tik Tik Boom, but Tik Nhat Han, died. He'd had a stroke many years ago, and uh, that really took its toll, and eventually it killed him. But he was 95, a highly respected and revered spiritual teacher who was exiled from Vietnam, apparently, in the 1960s because he opposed the war. But that was his whole thing, non-violence. And he was the founder, the proponent, the guy who came up with engaged Buddhism, which basically means that, okay, we know about meditation. Okay, we know about mindfulness. Yeah, 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 we've got all the principles. Now let's apply it to the real world, to social justice, to politics, to war, all these things that really matter. And that made him both influential, but also dangerous to those who like war and want more war. And uh, his ideas and words impacted millions and millions of people worldwide. And they were very sad when he died. But he was 95, and that's a really good age. In fact, he wasn't the least bit scared of dying. He wrote, birth and death are only notions. They are not real. The Buddha taught that there is no birth, there is no death, there is no coming, there is no going, there is no same, there is no different, there is no permanent self, there is no annihilation, we only think there is. Which of course made me incredibly curious about what his crossing was like. And when I went into the metaphorical cave again, there was nobody there. Usually they show up, they walk in, they fall down, their consciousness appears somehow. But not in the case of Thich Nhat Han. There was nobody there. I didn't quite know what to do. That's the first time that's ever happened. But then I noticed, as I looked around this metaphorical cave, that there was graffiti on the wall. Well, not graffiti. It's more like stains, actually. And I went over and looked at one of these stains. And it was him. I'm not quite sure how it was him, but it was him. It was his consciousness on the wall. And although I can't talk to these things, I mean, there's no conversation as such, I do get an impression of what the conversation would be if I were having it. And as I drew close to one of these stains, I got a very strong sense that he was saying something like, I was life, and now I am death. It's just a process. Which is really interesting, because I think that really reflected how he felt in life, that it was just a continuum. In fact, he said when he was alive, I am a continuation, like the rain is a continuation of a cloud. That's exactly what this was. And so I moved around and these stains were everywhere. He was this place. He wasn't in this place. He was this place. And I strolled alone up the symbolic tunnel I always see, and there were more stains on the wall. Even in the chamber that I see with the dome in it, the dome of light, stains on the wall. But as I watched, the stains moved down the wall and climbed into the light, merged with the light, stood at the center of the light. He was one with the universe, but he already knew that. He lived that way, as if he was one with the universe. There was nothing to strip away from him. He was actually the embodiment 
of universal energy while he was living. And gradually, that figure made of stains vanished into infinity. And out of curiosity, I wandered down the symbolic tunnel. I looked around and all the stains were gone. The walls were clean. There was nothing there. So he was the real deal, this guy. He really walked the talk. He lived his belief system. And his belief system seemed to be as close to the truth of how things are as it could possibly be. And from there, we plunge all the way down the consciousness scale to Sarah Palin. If you remember, she was the governor of Alaska and chosen ill-advisedly by John McCain as his vice presidential pick during the 2008 election, which caused him to lose to Barack Obama. That and many other things. But uh, she then went on to become a Fox News commentator. She had a bunch of series on different networks. And she even had her own channel, the Sarah Palin channel, which closed after a year. She wrote an autobiography called Going Rogue, which sold two million copies, which is incredible. And uh, since then, I think she's been searching for for relevance again. I think she really wants to be prominent because she enjoyed that and she felt she made a difference. But it's been very hard to find a footing because of what happened and she's seen as a figure for ridicule by many. Uh, Well, anyway, the New York Times maligned her, I think it's fair to say. Uh, Years ago, her political action committee published a map which contained targets, like rifle targets. And then soon after... Gabby Giffords was shot. Remember that whole incident in which uh, politicians were shot and Gabby Giffords was shot? And the New York Times, by mistake, it admits, said that there was a link between the map with the targets on and Gabby Giffords and others getting shot. I think Steve Scalise got shot as well. So uh, Sarah Palin, understandably, was mortified by that and decided to sue them for defamation. This week, the case was going to go ahead. There was going to be jury selection. But because Sarah Palin, being a Tea Party type person, refuses to get vaccinated, she got COVID for the second time. And so the case had to be postponed. So I thought I'd take a look at the energy between Sarah Palin and the New York Times. There they are, side by side. Now, Sarah Palin seemed, in the pictures anyway, to have a massive victim mentality. Some might say justifiably. And so she was in the pictures hammering them, going, you did me wrong. You said bad things. You are the mainstream media. You're unfair. You lie. She was just hammering, pummeling with her fists. Now, the New York Times is saying, hey, this is First Amendment territory. We made a mistake, we admit it, but you can't go suing for defamation simply because we made a mistake. It wasn't malicious, we just made a simple human error. Go away. She wasn't going away. No, this is a matter of principle. I don't forgive you. And she got in a little Humvee, a little car, and was driving alongside. (laughs) You're not shaking me off, pal. I'm with you to the very, very end. I'm not letting this go. I don't forgive. In fact, in David Hawkins' book, Letting Go, he talks about forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is hard. Actually, saying I forgive you when somebody has wronged us is hard. But don't forget, being offended is a choice. Being insulted is a choice. And David Hawkins says, well, look, what you do is, instead of forgiving the other person, you simply remove the reasons not to forgive them. The emotional burden that says, I can't forgive. Deal with that within yourself. Remove the obstacles to forgiveness and then forgiveness will follow. But maybe when you've been wronged in a national sense and humiliated, that's a lot harder to do. So Sarah Palin kept on driving. But as I followed it through, the New York Times went up a hill, 
Hills tend to be about challenges, overcoming obstacles. And Sarah Palin's little Humvee went right off the road. It seemed to be defeated, or she made mistakes, or her lawyers made mistakes, and it diverted itself off course and went into the scrub. It didn't seem to go very far. It's very likely that the defense of the First Amendment and an honest mistake will probably carry this through. I also took a look at the worsening crisis between NATO and Russia. Basically, Ukraine wants to become a part of NATO, and Russia does not want that. And as a sort of bullying force, a tactic, it has placed 100,000 troops on the border with Ukraine and possibly into Belarus as well to persuade Ukraine to have second thoughts. Uh, now, it could very well be that Putin decides to invade Ukraine at some point. But right now, he's holding off as my pictures before said he would. So I went into the energy. There was Russia looking incredibly aggressive. And uh, there was NATO. Well, NATO starts walking. Behind it, there is a ridge of some kind. Russia dives behind the ridge and watches NATO go by. It doesn't walk with it. It just stands aside and watches it like a voyeur. Then, when NATO has gone by, it runs after it, jumps on top of it, and drags it to the ground, pummeling it. The way Sarah Palin pummeled the New York Times. Then stands up and goes, there, that's taught you. Which says there is a massive ploy here. All is not as it seems. There's something going on behind the scenes with Russia. There's a bigger campaign. It's the diplomats of NATO are being bamboozled somehow by not knowing what Russia, Putin's bigger plan, is. Now, Putin has a problem, because if there is a war, if he goes in and Russian sons and daughters die, and Ukraine is promising that they will, that will be blood not on Ukraine's hands, but on Putin's hands for sending them in in the first place. That could lead to him being deposed and uh, losing all power. They could. The reason he's waiting is because he is attending the Beijing Olympics in February. And he wouldn't want there to be some kind of invasion going on at home while he's at the Olympics. He wants to be there for that. It would put a lot of pressure on China anyway. So he is holding off. It's a threat. It's a big bullying tactic to get what he wants. But it's very carefully planned. And Russia pummels NATO, then walks off. Ahead of it, ahead of Russia, there is one of those old-fashioned photo booths. Remember you went in, you pulled the curtains, you sat down and you made faces? And uh, you put it on your fridge? <laughs> well, there's like that, except that when he closes the curtains, behind him there is a ladder. He climbs the ladder. Nobody can see because the curtains are closed. Climbs the ladder, reaches the top, and there are two ways to go. One, over there, is dark and cloudy and stormy and intimidating and worrisome, and really, you don't want to go over there. This way, there's sunlight. Go to sunlight, you become a hero. You save the day. Your plan worked out, and everything is fine. Putin, Russia, they have this whole thing mapped out. They know how this could end. And it's in their power to make that decision. Sunlight, storm. Hero, defeat. So I went in to buy this energy. When I found him, there he was standing there. Over here on the horizon was a massive angry storm cloud. Now, it might be the Ukraine situation. It might be something else. I don't know. There's lots of things going on right now. But it felt to me like it might be Ukraine. Do you get involved or don't you get involved? A lot of trouble over there where the storm is. He walks over towards the storm. We can't let this go. We can't abandon it. We have to do something. 
But as he walks towards it, the ground beneath his feet starts subsiding. And it keeps on subsiding until there is a ravine, a valley, a gorge, a chasm right there that stops him going immediately across it. He could press on and walk around the gorge. It would take effort, real determination, aggression to do that. On the other hand, if he took the opening chasm as a warning sign, yeah, don't engage, just use diplomacy, say the right words, make maneuvers, but don't fight. Don't send Americans to war and to die. If he does that, there is another way around. Because there was a bridge over the chasm. There was a solution to this that he could take that would, in fact involve America sidestepping war and death. And he carried on walking. It was his choice. On the horizon as he walked, there was another cloud, not anywhere near as severe as this. That could be the midterms in November. But there was another cloud. So there were going to be problems down the road. But, you know, he's president. There are always problems. But he had a choice of how much this escalated. And the universe was telling him, no, don't do it. Don't go the whole way. Make noises, say the right things, do what you have to. Don't go the whole way. But if you are determined to go the whole way and walk around the chasm, well, you must take the consequences. But it will be very, very unpleasant. Will America get involved in a war with Russia? There you go. <laughs> All right, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. I totally appreciate it, as always. Like, that would be great. Subscribe, even better. Uh, share, that would be fantastic too. Or follow me on Twitter, at Cash Peters. That'd be great. Otherwise, I will see you next time, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.